All right, did anyone have any kind of uh, big trouble with the, the first assignment? Um, so the other ones will be of a, uh, of a kind of similar flavor, except we'll be more exploring the, the actual techniques instead of just the general principles. Um, so, um, so hopefully if you have questions, Yan's office hours on um, Monday morning. Did, uh, did people come on Monday? Yeah. Okay, so good. People came even though there was like, the crazy snow, so uh, that's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, the, the next homework is, is basically ready. I'll probably post it tonight. I just haven't gotten around to putting it up on the web yet. Um, so it'll be on the, the stuff of similarity, starting with doing shingling, uh, and then kind of on the techniques we talked about on Monday and today, and then uh, a small bit on the couple lectures next week as well. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about um, locality um, sensitive um, hashing. So, um, what we're able to do before is we started um, uh, with these documents. And the goal was to find um, which are similar. Um, um, and so what we did is we transformed them into sets, and then we transformed them into vectors. Um, and then um, we're able to get this representation as vectors, but now what we want to do is find all the documents which are similar to each other. Um, and, but we still have a representation where we have this, these, if we have some n um, um, documents where n is, um, uh, think of it as something like a million. Um, so we're looking at a bunch of web pages or something, a bunch of articles, we're trying to analyze all these things, and there's n million, and we want to find which ones are similar, but we have to check, in order to do that, we have to check the pairs of the documents, right? We have to check, um, to do this, we have to check about um, notation n choose 2, which is n times n minus 1 over 2 pairs of documents that, that we want to check how similar these are, and then we want to find the ones that have a small similar, say next, um, less than a threshold. And you know, this number is roughly n squared, and n squared of a million is going to be um, a trillion, right? Um, this is probably going to take too long. Um, we want to avoid some n squared computation here. So, and we want to find which things are similar. Um, so, um, how do we do this, right? So I'll start. Um, let's start. Say instead of vectors, you can think of vectors as points in like a high-dimensional space. But let's say we start with um, points in it um, in a two-dimensional space, and we want to set some radius. And you can think of like a ball around here, and find all pairs of points which are within a ball of this radius. This looks, doesn't look quite like a ball, but I'll just pretend that's a ball. Um, so we want to find all pairs of points which are um, within this radius. Um, um, so for instance, it would maybe be these two pairs, right? Um, there could be other pairs. It, it doesn't have to be exactly kind of paired up. And there are some that aren't within, any, within that distance of anything. You know, maybe you could have three points which are all in that distance, right? Um, so how do we quickly find these without checking all n squared pairs? Does so anyone have any ideas how we do this? Partition the space. Um, partition the space. Okay, good. Um, um, so in in two D, um, this actually works really well. And what we'll talk about next week, Wednesday, is for low and um, medium dimensional spaces. How can you do this? And you do something. Um, called like a KD tree, where you um, 
you split it based on the median on the x value, and then in each half you split it based on the median of the, the y value, and you partition the space, and then you check things within here. These are in the same part of the space, and I don't have to, may not have to check something very far away. Um, so generally what this is doing is it's somehow laying down some sort of grid structure on this, on this data, And if, if two points tend to fall inside the same um, grid cell, then, they're, um, th then it means that these two points are close. Right? So these, these points are on the same, maybe all three of these are on the same grid cell, right? and they're close. But I haven't found all pairs of points. There are some which are maybe in a grid cell which is neighboring. So I can't just check the ones which are in the same grid cell, but I have to check the same grid cell and um, maybe also the neighboring grid cells, right? So, um, so if I start, if I start with the cell here, then I have to check at least this neighbor, this neighbor, this neighbor, and this neighbor. But it's also possible that I have another point over here, and this could still be close. Right? So I also have to check you know, these neighbors as well. OK, so, so now this, this grid technique is the right, is going to turn out to be a good way to, uh, to think about things. For if you're searching in two or three dimensional or 10 dimensional space, so we'll see next, next Wednesday I'll talk about um, you're going to build a um, hierarchical structure on the grid instead of just looking at the grid um, by itself. Um, but let's just think about this grid structure. Um, in, in 2D, this is probably going to work fine. You can, you can actually do these, these operations with points where you essentially say that these, these have an x value and a y value. And if you round it onto the right coordinate, it places it in the, in the grid automatically. Right? So you can, you can, in constant time per point, find which grid cell it's in. Um, but in um, high dimensions, um, um, this is going to be a problem, right? If you look at, um, let's look at one of these grid cells here. Um, let me conserve space a little bit better here. Uh, let's look at one of these of these grid cells here, and I'm going to have. So if I've got a point here and the radius is going to be this big, I'm going to have two types of neighbors, right, in, um, in two dimensions. If I just need to check the ones that border on an edge, if I think about these, in, in two dimensions there are four neighbors, right? In, in a D equals two, there equals four, um, edge um, neighbors. Um, in, the, in a high dimensional D, right, so in a, in a high dimensional space, remember these vectors we generated need to be in something like uh, like a thousand dimensional space, right? Um, so, so as D gets big, as a function of D, how many of these type of edge neighbors do I have? What per dimension, right? Uh, um, um, yeah, two per dimension. So in general, this is going to be two times d of these edge um, neighbors. I can't spell neighbors. Uh, okay. Um, so, but let's think about. So it, it turns out higher dimensions are actually um, there are actually many types of neighbors. There's not just an edge. And, uh, and a corner neighbor, but there are other types. Well, let's just look at the corner neighbors. If you look at this, this corner here, go across the corner, this is a, a let's call this a corner neighbor. In, in D dimensions, how many, so in, in D equals two, there are four um, corner neighbors. How many, Corner neighbors are there in as a function of D? Two, three, two, three, 
Yeah, there are two to the d corner numbers. So if d is something like, even if d is something like 20, you know, this number is huge. This is, this is way too big, and this approach is not even close to feasible. You can't even, you know, putting down a grid on data in high dimensions just, um, just doesn't work, right? The, the, the one, this is one instance of um, what's called the um, curse of dimensionality. And we'll talk about a few things in this course of how to um, try and beat the curse of dimensionality. Um, but point, point out this grid, because there are so many neighbors you have to check in high dimensions, is um, um, it's not going to work. There's actually some recent paper that kind of shows that you can do this a bunch of times by randomly shifting the grid and, uh, and not checking any of your neighbors, and sometimes you're okay. But, um, but in, in, uh, uh, but doing this in general, um, it's not going to work. Um, so let's relook at this. So um, what do I want to say? So uh, um, this, so what we're going to do is something called. Um, locality sensitive patching. And so one thing I want to make clear is there are two types of um, hash functions. Okay, um, so, so today we're going to talk about these uh, uh, um, locality sensitive ones. Um, so type one, so type two is going to be these locality sensitive hash functions. But what you're probably more, um, we've probably heard it before and thought of this hash function before, is uh, what I'm calling a random um, hash function. And actually, we've well, uh, this time we've talked about already the the um, so basically what it is is you're going to have some some family of hash functions H. You're going to take one of these out here at random, and then um, and then this this is going to be a function. So it's going to map um, from this space of space of objects. Let's call this space uh, E, and it's going to usually map it to uh, um, this um, this object in, into some domain N, and it's it's going to want to have the property um, that um, the probability, given your choice of hash function, that h of x equals h of x prime for x not equal x prime in, in our set of objects um, is going to be equal to 1 over n. Right? So we want that the probability of a collision between two objects is equal to the number of bins that we have, right? So this is um, this is something we had to use. Um, we had to use something like this in, um, when we were doing the min hash, right? Um, so, and one of the things about hash functions is uh, so often you've heard about them in class, but a lot of people actually um, it's common. To, to actually implement a hash function wrong. Um, so let me just give you, I, and there's a little bit more details in the, in the notes in the, that's in the version with, with more writing um, about how to construct um, hash functions. Um, but let me just give you an example of the type of <coughs> hash function which should work pretty well. So what we're going to do is we're going to say a hash function HA of X is going to be equal to um, um, the floor um, of n times the um, the fractional part of x times a. <coughs> um, 
So let me explain this. Right? So um, what's going on here? The fractional part of a number, so frac of say 15.321 is going to be equal to 0 0.321. So it's taking only the part that's after the decimal. Right? Um, and so this hash function is is, is, a, is a perfectly fine, it always returns the same value once you fix this value A here. Um, and this, this floor function, so the floor function of a value, let's say 15.321, um, this is called the floor, is going to be equal to 15. So what it's, it's, it's rounding down to the, um, to the smallest integer less than. Right? So, when you, so this fractional part needs to be between 0 and 1. This is a, uh, the number of elements, the size of this domain, and so this part is going to be some fractional thing. It's not going to be an integer, and you do this, it rounds it to an integer. And so it maps it actually, um, so actually this is between 1 and n, but this will be between 0 and n minus 1. What if that were negative 15.321 were to go? Down to negative fifteen, or would it go toward? Is it toward zero or toward negative infinity? Uh, oh, the uh, uh, fractional part. The floor. Um, just in this case, just you want to round it um, so it's it's a positive fraction. Okay. So get rid of the minus sign as well. Yeah. Was a a constant or what? And was so a is a constant. Okay. Um, so remember, I chose I had to choose a random hash function from some family, and. How, how I chose this is by choosing this value a. So this hash function is defined by a. Okay. Um, so then what you do is you choose, um, so, so you want to choose a so it's going to be some large number um, that if you look at its binary representation, it's a good mix of zeros and ones. So basically you figure out uh, some maybe 16, maybe 32 bits, and then randomly choose zeros and ones. Um, so a equals um, random choice of zeros and ones in bits. Um, so if you do this hash function, it'll it's kind of it's, it's kind of um, pretty good properties. So there are some notions about the um, the relative. Um, or the, um, uh, the degree of independence. So this says that any two values are going to be independent one over n, but maybe you pick two <coughs> values. You want to know the probability that all of them apply to be um, 1 over n squared. And that's a higher level of independence. And there's a lot of work on efficient hash functions that have a higher level of independence. It's, most algorithms require something like three or four no more than three or four levels of independence, um, but usually using something like this is fine. Also, if, you have, if you're working with a programming language, they probably have built-in hash functions you can use. Um, if you need to code something, using those is fine. But if you want to explicitly code your own, you should do, um, this is a good thing to try and do. Um, um, okay, so, um, um, so I'm not going to say any more about this. And the reason I talked about it is because I wanted to make clear that the locality sense of hashing is different than this random hash function. Okay, and I want to spell it out so you don't try and confuse these. They're trying to do something, um, actually, uh, um, something that's very different. In fact, this property to hold that they're not equal to each other, that means that even if they're the same you know, they look the same. If you write out their bits, they're off by one zero is flipped to a one somewhere, maybe in the lowest precision. You still want this property. So even if they're very similar numbers, you still want them to very small chance of collision. With the um, locality sense of hashing, uh, uh, what you want is the opposite. That if they are very similar, you want them to hash um, to, um, you want, they're similar, then you want the probability of collision to be higher. Right? So, so we're going to look at designing hash functions that, um, that have this property. Um, and so, um, so, so in particular, 
a um, well, okay, this is called specifically you're going to have a, a gamma um, phi alpha beta L S H. Um, so you're going to have so so to define it formally, you need four parameters for a um, locality sense of hash function. Um, in certain cases, like um, the min hash that I'll talk about as an example of this, how you use it, um, it turns out you don't. You only kind of need two parameters. Two of two of them mean uh, you, you can use to represent the other. But in, in general, you're going to want all four of these parameters. And what what these means is that the probability that um, let's say you have two things that if you have two elements which collide so that they hash to the same thing um, so if this is greater than alpha um, this is true if the distance between A and, and B is less than uh, um, if this distance is less than gamma and the probability that H A equals H B is going to be less than beta if the distance A B is going to be greater than phi. So basically if the distance is small, it's less than some parameter gamma, then you want the probability that they collide to be higher than some value. And if the distance is large, they're far apart, then you want the distance they collide to be, um, um, you want this to be small, smaller than some beta. Um, and so generally, um, um, the goal is to have alpha minus beta um, to, be, uh, um, to be large, and you want, um, uh, minus gamma uh, to be small. Um, so what you want is that the, the, the threshold for the distance, and in fact, maybe you want these to be the same. If this, if this, if you want to find all things less than some distance, say like um, less than distance 7, right? So if you set gamma and phi equal to 7, then you want all things less than that distance to have a a, um, um, a large probability of, um, of colliding, and all things greater than that distance have a small probability of colliding. Right? So if, if you go back to this example of the grid, if this distance here, blue, if this, this r is equal to um, gamma is equal to phi, right, then you want the probability of things which are inside this radius <coughs> Um, to have a high probability of falling in the same cell. And if they are greater than this radius, you want a low probability of falling in the same cell. Um, so then, um, so then once you have, if you have a hash function with this property, then you're going to do, you're going to take many of these hash functions and um, and it's going to, um, and so what's going to happen is if things are close, they're going to more often tend to collide uh, uh, more than once, or, um, or maybe you say they're going to collide at least once, right? So the things that are closer uh, um, are going to have more collisions, and the things that are further are going to have less collisions, right? So um, then um, repeat. Um, so again, you're going to be drawing these functions from a family of hash functions, so you repeatedly draw these hash functions. And, um, and so then, um, closer objects is going to have um, more collisions. And um, further, objects are going to have less um, collisions.
Great. Um, so let's see how this works with. Um, so the first example of this we're going to do is the, um, is the min hash, well, um, which we talked about on Monday, and um, the min hash had the property that um, the the probability that H A equals H B is equal to um, 1 minus the Jacquard with, uh, is, is equal to the Jacquard um, similarity of A and B. Right? So if you turn this into the distance, um, then let's say we want to find, um, so then <coughs> let's go, we want to find, um, so, uh, pairs with um, um, that, um, the, let me just write in terms of the distance um, that the Jacquard distance so the one minus the Jacquard similarity is going to be um, let's say less than equal to tau um, some threshold tau so let's say this is equal to say 0.3 so all things that have Jacquard um, distance, well, a more reasonable number might be 0 0.7. Right. So we want to find all things with the Jacquard distance less than 0 0.7. Um, so then what this means is that um, if we, um, I claim that the Jacquard um, um, that the min hash um, for the Jacquard distance is going to be a tau um, tau um, I did write this down. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, the, the probability is greater than 1 minus tau. 1 minus tau. Okay. Um, does this make sense? Uh, then they, so let's see. So that if the distance is less than tau, the distance is less than tau, the probability that they are, um, that they collide is <coughs> the Jacquard similarity, which is 1 minus tau. Right, so that's gamma and alpha. And the, the, if the distance is greater than tau, the probability that um, they collide is, um, is less than 1 minus tau, which is, is beta, is B and beta. Right, so, so if I want to do this different, so, so often what you do is you leave some, um, you can leave a gap between um, this gamma and this tau. So if you said something like um, plus, plus alpha here, and then you can get minus, well, should use alpha, uh, plus um, on psi. Right, some other small amount, right? Uh, yeah, some other small amount, just to get a little bit more um, you, you, you go, um, um, you, you can get some more separation here, but this separation isn't um, so necessary. Actually, um, you can you can apply the analysis um, just with um, just with using um, this tau directly. But in another LSH, you'll see at the end um, it, it it'll be necessary to have a separate. So you won't be able to have tau here and also the same here, right? You'll have to have to use slightly different bounds in order to get some bounds. Um, yeah. So, um, so now that we have this process, which is exactly the min hash, it satisfies this property of this gamma phi alpha beta uh, um, locality sense of hash function. 
Um, have we finished? Have we figured out how to find similar documents without doing n squared, n squared calculations? <coughs> How would you use this? Hash two things to check if they're close or not. Yeah, so, um, so you can hash two things and um, um, you check the close. So if two things collide together, um, then you're going to ch check the actual distance. Right? Um, and then you're going to uh, maybe, <laughs> this isn't going to find everything, so maybe you're going to do a bunch of these hash functions somehow, right? In, in order to make, so, um, one thing we showed last time is that if you do a bunch of these hash functions that the estimate of the Jacquard similarity actually converges based on doing this. So we're going to do this a bunch of times because if we only do this once, the probability of having a collision is only the Jacquard similarity, right? So if the Jacquard similarity is 0.3, we'll only find um, maybe, maybe a third or a 30% of the things that actually satisfy that, right? Um, that have that or uh, um, some higher similarity, right? So we're only going to find some small subset of the ones at that time, and we're also going to have some false positives, also some things that um, don't have a small, but don't have a large Jacquard similarity. Um, we're also going to find. And in fact, if this fraction is, if the Jacquard similarity is say. Um, 0.3, so the distance is 0.7, that means that we're going to find, uh, so, so let's say that the, um, that, that most things have a Jacquard similarity of um, 0.5, that means they're going to hash together in the same band with probability 0.5. So for every pair, 50% probability, um, they're going to end up in the same, end up with the, with the same value. Um, which, uh, which means that we're going to still check about n squared of these, of these elements. Because uh, if you look at any pair at random, 50% chance we have to check it. Um, so this is going to be too much. So is this clear? Um, so I, I'm getting some blank stare. So I, I explain that. In, in words, maybe I can try and work through that a little bit, right? So, um, so let's say that you have um, four um, documents here, D1, D2, D3, and D4, and let me write out um, 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 so if I write out um, the, um, the Jacquard similarity between the documents, let's say this one is going to be, well, actually, two of the same documents is always going to be one. And I'm, it's symmetric, so I'll ignore the top part. Let's say these two have a Jacquard similarity of 0.75. So these are, say, close. Um, the, and then these, so D1 and D3 have a, um, have a Jacquard similarity of 0 0.5. Um, so D1 and D3 and D1 and D4 have 0 0.5. And D2 and D3, let's say also 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. So document 3 and document 4 are, are more similar, they're close. And document 1 and document 2 are close. And a lot of other ones are, are far, but not too far, right? So if, I, so, um, so if I do a hash function, if I do a hash function, what's the probability that D1 and D2 um, are going to collide? 0.75. Um, yes, 0.75. And what's the probability that, um, so that D2 and D3, which are not similar, are going to collide? Point five, right? So, um, so what's the so what's the expected number of distances I'm going to have to check? So 
how would I calculate the expected number of distances I have to check? So I can use the um, so who's heard of the uh, um, who's heard of the linearity of expectation? Who's not heard of this? Okay. So if if you want to know the so a cool thing about the expected value is that if it's the expected value, um, so let's say you have a bunch of events, x1, x2, up to xn, and I want to estimate the expected value of the sum of, of all these events, right? Um, I can write this as the sum um, of the expected values of each of the events. So this property is known as the linearity of expectation. You can also, if you're multiplying, you can also factor out multiples and stuff. But this is this is the only property that we'll need in order to factor this, right? So these are events. This is the, the cost I have to do. So each of these cells where I may need to check the distance, there are six cells here. These are the pairs I need to worry about. Each of those is one of these random events. And this is the expected cost of checking this, right? I have to, it costs me one distance calculation if they hatch to the same spot. So the expected cost of this is 0.75, right? So that's the expected cost of the cell one. And so I have six cells, and I want to know the expected cost of all these distance calculations. And so I can add up all these expected values, and that's going to be the total expected cost of how many distance calculations I have to do. OK? Um, so now, what's the expected number of distance calculations I have to do? Minus 6. What was the answer? It's 7.5. So uh, ignore these, because I don't have to check something with itself. Uh, so the thing is, the expected cost is going to be um, is, is going to be uh, 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.75 plus 0.75.